to create, uh, embrace a culture of failure. Now, uh, in the 1990s, we had the biggest expansion of cultural infrastructure in the history of this country. We built $25 billion, B, billion dollars worth of new theaters, museums, and concert halls. It's an awful lot of infrastructure to have to, uh, have to maintain, right? Uh, but what it also means is that it up the stakes. And most organizations now don't have much tolerance for failure. What happens, though, is if, if you won't tolerate failure, you don't learn. And you also fall farther behind. Um, the head of new products for uh, Procter & Gamble came in and decided that their uh, success rate for new project products was too high. So he backed it down to 52%. I don't know why specifically 52%, but 52%. Why? He said, if we're succeeding with too many things, it means we're not experimenting enough. Uh, let's see, how do, uh, how do we address the issue of too many great choices in capturing live performances with their potential natural flaws that will uh, be captured forever and sent around the world? Well, um, actually, I have a whole talk about that. <laughs> um, the thing is, getting your message out, the problem is, um, the problem is people are not paying attention to you, not because they don't like what you're saying. Um, the reason that people aren't paying attention to you is they don't know what you're saying, right? In order to get constituency, in order to get to a wider audience, uh, you have to get out to as many people as, as, as possible. And that's why there's this whole economy of free that's, that's grown up. If you remove all the barriers to your product, uh, then you get a wider constituency. Once you've got that constituency, then you can find ways to monetize it. It's called the freemium model. It's what the iPhone apps are built on. You'll, you'll have a million apps that are downloaded for free. Then you have the relationship with the person, and you say, hey, for 99 cents, we can do this for you. And, um, uh, and then people will buy it. Another question, the question for me is, are people even noticing the art music and actually having an experience, or are they just recording what has happened, uh, where they happen to, uh, uh, where they happen to uh, be? Um, it, you know, it doesn't really matter. The experience is the experience. If the experience that you're offering is special, and if it's unique to the place in, in which you're doing it, sending out pieces of it in some way or another, it doesn't really matter how people are using it, because once they, once they use it in ways that they want to have, then you have the opportunity of trying to interest them in using it in ways that, um, that you want them to have. Uh, but back to the culture of failure for a second. Um, uh, Pixar is one of the most uh, one of the most successful movie studios uh, of all time. It's had uh, two, four, five, five, uh, five. It's released uh, uh, five movies. Uh, six just came out. Uh, every one of them has made money. This is unheard of for a movie studio. What's their secret? They have lots of secrets actually, but this one really kind of grabbed me. This is uh, Lee uh, Unkrich, the director of Toy Story 3 that just came out. He says, it's important that nobody get, gets mad at you for screwing up. We know screw-ups are an essential part of making something good. And that's why our goal is to screw up as fast as possible. <laughs> so every day they have a meeting and they go over what they did the day before. And the whole goal of this meeting is to find out where the failure points are. What didn't work? What didn't work? And nobody feels constrained about not uh, uh, sharing criticism or being being criticized because um, they uh, it's part of the culture of getting better. Uh, somebody says a recent soloist with our orchestra phone found an iPhone video online insisted it be uh, removed instantly. Ironclad recording contract. Uh, we would have loved publicity. Yeah, it's true. I, you know, it's easy for me to stand up here and say, hey, you ought to sh I'll share <laughs> everything. You ought to be able to, to, to share performances and all that. And I realize that there are huge barriers to that, musician contracts and all of that. I realize that. I really do. These are really difficult issues. But the reality is it doesn't work. It's not working right now. And uh, we don't know what the new system is going to be. And we've got to figure that out. I actually view this as one of the most important issues 
face in the orchestra world today because everybody else is doing this in some form. And we've got to be able to figure out a way to do it as well. Um, it's just, you know, uh, interesting this ha thing has happened in the indie music world. Um, the younger musicians all get this. It's the way that they get audiences, it's the way that they get gigs, it's the way that they have big careers. The older artists who recorded with the big recording companies and are invested in the old system, they're fighting against it as, as a lot of them are fighting against it really hard uh, because they're invested in the old system. I suspect that that's going to be true in classical music for a while as well. Uh, failure. Um, University or Penn, Penn State University actually has a class that they put people through. It's called Failure 101. The engineer, engineering students, the goal of the thing is to figure out creative ways to fail. And you don't get an A until you fail spectacularly <laughs> in really good fashion because they know that that's how you learn. Three, don't just add noise. It's what I said before is if you're just creating more things for people to have to sort through, you're creating a problem for people um, uh, other than that. Somebody just says, uh, have you been asked by the AF of M to participate in conversations about the future of media agreements? And, uh, actually, I've been on several panels with them. It, it gets to be a very interesting conversation. <laughs> uh, don't just add noise. Um, there are too many places for people to go and talk these days. There are too many places to go and get interesting information. There's just like so much of that now. And the mistake that a lot of um, uh, newspapers make, a lot of uh, arts organizations make, is if we do something really interesting, people will come. You know, it's the build it and they will come model. That doesn't work anymore because there's just too much choice, right? So if that's the case, how do you build a community around you? Well, the way you build a community around you is not just to say, here, come and have a little conversation. You ask people to participate in the life of the organization, in the life of the community, in meaningful ways. I want to give you one example here that I think is really kind of interesting, because you can't look at your audience just as people who are consuming things, right? We have this artificial thing of saying, artists here, audience here. Now, it's sometimes you're the artist, sometimes you're the audience, and sometimes you're actually a little bit of both. What's really powerful is that if you can find ways so that the circulation back and forth across is, is interesting. This is Netflix. How many people have Netflix? Quite a few, okay. So Netflix is a wonderful service. They send you movies. Uh, on a list that you have. But one of the competitive advantages they have is that um, uh, they have this algorithm. And as you start to choose movies, it starts to figure out what your taste is, and it starts recommending movies for you. Okay, so to maintain their competitive edge, they have to uh, keep improving the algorithm so that it makes better and better choices for you. So about two and a half years ago, uh, Netflix got to the point where their engineers couldn't improve the algorithm anymore. They, they would improve it by you know, 1%, and that just wasn't doing it. So Netflix had a real um, interesting um, uh, problem. They could go out and hire another 100 engineers to, to, to go and try and improve the algorithm, or they could do something different. And what they did was they created something called the Netflix Prize. Now, the Netflix Prize went something like this. Um, they offered a million dollars to anybody who could come and improve the algorithm by 10%. Wow. A million dollars. Okay, within about three months, there were 40,000 programmers around the world, best programmers around the world, all working on trying to solve the Netflix algorithm. Everybody wants that million dollars. Right? Uh, so a year and a half goes by, and people are working, 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 and they stall out at around eight and a half percent, and it stays there for several months. Well, you know, people are starting to get frustrated when something interesting happened. Um, four of the top ten groups decided to combine forces, and they created something uh, a group called Belcor's Pragmatic Chaos. Uh, you'll see that um, 
Melkor was a group by itself. Chaos was another group. Okay. So four of them got together. And um, lo and behold, about another month and a half, uh, they announced that they had cracked 10%. So they claimed the prize. Now, um, the rest of the people on the list were none too happy about that. Here's the rules of the contest. When somebody declares themselves the winners, everybody else has 30 days in which to beat them. <laughs> 400 of the other groups suddenly got together really fast. They created a group called the Ensemble. And on the 29th day, late in the day, they submitted and they beat it by 10.10. In other words, 0.01% they beat it. Okay, so I, I think there are just so many interesting lessons about this uh, from, from this example. Number one, um, for two and a half years, if you were watching 40,000 of the planet's smartest people trying to work on your thing from the outside, what would you think? That must be some kick-ass algorithm, right? Wow, Netflix must be really kind of an amazing thing if all these smart people can't figure it out. What great brand enhancement. But there's another thing that's, that, that, that's, that's important here, and that is that when you open something up and you ask the community to get involved in the core of your business, they will accomplish things that you cannot possibly do by yourself. Open source always beats closed systems. Now that's a difficult, a difficult sort of thing to, to, to sort of come to terms with uh, in the orchestra world because we don't want just anybody uh, ambling up on stage and picking up a violin. It's not going to sound all that great. But there are a whole lot of things that you can do as part of the community. If you're not selling your concerts anymore as a product, if you're selling a community, if you're building a community built around shared interest in something, in classical music, in orchestral music, there are many roles within that community that have to be filled. And if you ask people to help you in a variety of ways, give them important things to do, uh, then, uh, then, then they will do amazing things for you. Okay, so some uh, uh, smart ass person um, <laughs> is asking, wouldn't you say that money was driving Netflix, not just the honor of it? Absolutely right. But guess what? If Netflix had to, um, if Netflix had gone the other route and hired those, you know, hundreds of other engineers to do it, would have cost a hell of a lot more than a, than a million dollars, right? It was a bargain. And what, what it got them done, what, what got them all um, into it was they wanted the million dollars but they were also intrigued by the challenge. Okay? So, um, and in fact, that's sort of an interesting thing, as, as somebody who's, who's uh, run a lot of communities and, and thought about ways to um, uh, motivate people, um, one thing I've discovered is that money is the least effective way of motivating people to participate in your community. The least effective way. The most effective way is to pay them in social capital is to differentiate them within the community. Because it turns out the community is a very hierarchical in nature. Not necessarily competitive, although competitiveness is part of it, but hierarchical in the sense that people want to stand out in that community and feel that they are contributing in some way and are recognized for that. Uh, I have a bunch of stories about, about how you do this online, but I, I won't go into them now. But, um, uh, absolutely um, uh, incentivizing people to participate and do things for you that you can't do by yourself, right? So I can't get to that to three and a half million, uh, those three and a half million followers unless somebody does it for me. And if I can motivate people to do things like that, just talk within their networks, then I've accomplished something that I couldn't have done by myself. Uh, let's see. Uh, somebody is saying, it looks like a CSO is recording the presentation today. Will it be available for viewing online to share with the rest of our staff? Yeah. Uh, yeah? No? Maybe? Okay. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see about that. 